Well, happy Easter, church. He is risen. It's a special day in the life of the church. Easter Sunday is a day that we remember and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And while we do take time to get dressed up maybe a little bit more than usual, put on our Easter duds and come to church and celebrate the resurrection and and make time specifically to remember Easter, the reality is that we can enjoy and celebrate and live in the resurrection, the power of the resurrection every single day, because our Savior Jesus is alive. Yes. (laughs) At the same time, we do give special attention to Easter. Because we know that the resurrection is an historical event. It happened in real time and a certain day in a certain place. And so we do take time to mark the moment, this historical event, and it's a holiday in our society. And so we do take time to recognize Easter. We also celebrate Easter in a unique way, because Easter is often a time when those who maybe haven't been to church in a while make their way back for a Sunday service, or maybe those who have never been to church have heard about churches celebrating on Easter Sunday, and they come to church for the first time. Many come to churches to check out what is going on and who this Jesus person is and what they are all about. And so today, if that's you, if you've made your way back to church or if you've come to church for the first time, I want to offer you a very special welcome this morning. You are welcome here. Anyone and everyone is welcome here at this church. This church is a welcoming place. And so this morning, let me read for you our welcome, not just to those of you who are guests, but to all of us this morning, to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. Would you stand now if you're able? We're going to sing some songs to start our service.
Who else would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing. But this joy is mine.
you pray with me? Amen. Praise be to God. Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, you indeed, you alone deserve our glory, our honor, our praise. Lord, we magnify you this morning, and we thank you. Um, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us first. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Before you have a seat, would you turn to someone and say, Happy Easter. One of the podcasts that I listen to regularly, on that podcast, the host asks his guest a series of questions. He says, tell me what's a rose, tell me what's a thorn, and tell me what's a bud. And the rose represents something good that's going on in the life of the guest. Tell me, tell me about a rose. Something that's positive and giving them life and they're excited about. Obviously, the the thorn is the opposite. What's something going on in life that's causing a little bit of irritation or pain? Something you wish maybe you could get rid of? And then the bud. What's a bud in your life? This is something that the guest is looking forward to. Something that they're excited about happening in the future. And on the the podcast, this is the most fascinating question to hear the guest answer because it involves hope. It involves more about them sharing about their, their lives and what they're excited about, what they're hopeful for. The question of what's a rose, what's a thorn, and what's a bud is one that allows us to get a glimpse into the person's life and more specifically, what they are hoping for. One of my closest friends asks me the question regularly, what are you looking forward to? The first time he asked me the question, I said, like now, like today? Because if you were to ask me that question and you want me to give you an answer, it's either going to be lunch, dinner, or breakfast, depending on the time of day in which you ask me that question. I pressed a little bit further and said, do you mean like, what am I looking forward to in my life? Or just generally what I'm looking forward to today, what I'm excited about, what do you mean? And he said, well, I don't really care. I'm really just asking you to the question to check in on how you are doing. I was puzzled and said, tell me more. He said, you always have to have something that you're excited about for the future. Because if you don't have a bud, if you don't have something that you're excited about for the future, you don't have a lot of hope. He said, I'm asking you the question to check in to see if you have any hope in your life because I want to know how you're doing. It's a great question. What are you looking forward to? And he's right. We absolutely need hope in our lives. We need some kind of hope. In our lives, the the question, what is a bud or what are you looking forward to, are questions that help us gauge the level of hope in our lives because hope is so important. And it's not just me who's telling you this, that hope is important. In the magazine Psychology Today, The cover image is this image of the power of hope. In 2023, there was a study conducted by a series of psychologists on the topic of hope. 
And they found out a whole bunch of interesting things. Let me just share with you one quote from the article. In studying this field, this idea of hope, this field of hope, a pattern emerges. People high in hope have sustainably better physical and mental well-being. They also tend to live longer and have happier lives. High hope people see and respond to the world differently. If you're a Christ follower, you aren't surprised by any of this at all. You know the power of hope. We've known about this secret about hope for a long time. And not just the simple, what are you excited about or what's a bud in your life, but a a deeper, a more meaningful hope. Throughout history, Christians have been known as the people of high hope. As early as 50 AD, there are non-biblical historical documents written by Roman leaders describing Christians living in the Roman Empire. And these leaders describe these Christians as being so strange because they have so much joy and hope, a joyful vision for the future. These leaders describe persecuted Christians in the first century. They're described by these leaders as dying full of joy, as though they had a hope that was not of this world. In the third century, Cyprian, maybe a name that you have heard, he's a a famous church father from northern Africa. He would later become the bishop of Carthage. And he wrote this letter to one of his dear friends, Donatus. Let me just share it with you this morning. I think the quote is on the screen. It's a bad world, Donatus. An incredibly bad world. Isn't it comforting to know that people in the third century write the same way we write today? It's a bad world, Donatus, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and good people who have learned the great secret of life. They have found a joy and a wisdom which is a thousand times better than any of the pleasures of our sinful life. They have hope. They are despised. And they're persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people, Donatists, are Christians. And I am one of them. Isn't it powerful to see this idea of hope being so important and so powerful in our modern day lives, in psychology today, and in the third century Christian fathers. Since our earliest days, Christians have been known as the people of hope, people full of hope. Despite circumstances, Christ followers have hope. They have this hope that things will always get better. And if they don't get better, it's okay. I can persevere because I still have hope. This hope brings this otherworldly joy in the midst of suffering. It brings peace in the midst of chaos. It brings stillness in the throes of violent storms. We have hope that an uncertain future is not uncertain to God. We have hope even in the midst of the most brutal situations that the world can throw at us. Christ followers are people of hope. The Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, in fact, he's known as Jesus' closest friend, his closest disciple, his dear buddy. He is known as the Apostle of hope. 
And his letters, the the letters that he wrote to the church, which are found in the Bible, these letters that Peter wrote are known as the letters of hope. Which if you know the story of Peter at all, if you know the life of Peter at all, it's pretty interesting that he would be known as the apostle of hope and that his letters would be known as the letters of hope. If you Recall, Peter was the apostle, the the disciple on the night that Jesus was killed. He's the one that got so afraid and he ran away and he tried to hide. And in the midst of hiding, he denied that he even knew Jesus. The Peter, Peter, the, the man who had spent three years with Jesus, ministering with Jesus and eating with Jesus and walking with Jesus and laughing with Jesus and crying with Jesus, becoming Jesus's best friend. And in this moment of confusion and wondering what was happening and fear, Peter denied that he even knew the man. Peter had lost all hope. The pain of the situation drove him not to cling to hope, but to cling to himself, to begin to protect himself. And I'm sure many of us, when we hear that story or we think about Peter, many of us can relate. I'm sure many of us have had situations in our lives where our hope is pretty low. It feels hopeless. Maybe it's a an extended season that you go through, or maybe it's just in a dark night of the soul where you say all feels hopeless. I think we can relate to Peter. But what's powerful is that Peter didn't stay in this hopeless state. Jesus didn't leave Peter there. After his death, Jesus goes back and he He discovers Peter. Peter had had left the scene, had denied Christ three times, and had left and went back to his former life. He was a fisherman. He's with his fisherman buddies. And one morning, early in the morning, they're out fishing, and they're getting hungry, and they look to the shore, and they see a small fire burning and some smoke trickling off the fire, and they, they see a man on the shore cooking breakfast. And as they make their way back to shore, they discover that it's actually Christ on the shore. He's making them breakfast and he's serving as the cook and the waiter. And in that moment, Christ asks Peter three questions. And in those three questions, he restores Peter He restores him and he recommissions him to ministry. He says, Peter, you're not a fisherman. You're so much more than that. And he he gives Peter hope again. And so when we think about the life of Peter, Peter is someone in the biblical story that we can look to who, who knows the power of hope. Perhaps more than any other disciple, Peter knows the importance of having hope and not losing hope in Christ. And this is why Peter is known as the apostle of hope and why his letters are known as the letters of hope. Peter penned some of the most famous lines in the Bible about hope. And we're going to look at one of those lines this morning. Just one verse this morning for Easter Sunday, but it is a perfect verse for today. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. If you want to turn there in your copy of the scriptures, you're welcome to. The words will also be on the screen behind me. Peter writes this. After offering just two verses of some introductory remarks, Peter gets right into his, the start of his letter by saying this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Isn't that a perfect verse for Easter Sunday? Peter starts off his, this line by praising God the Father. Why? Why is he praising God the Father? 
Because Peter says in his great mercy, he has given us new birth, new life. The phrase that we sometimes use for this is born again. He's given us new life. We're we're born again. And Peter is sharing in this, this one line, in this beginning of this verse, he's sharing this major foundational truth to Christianity. What Peter is saying is that we were once dead, that we were dead in our sin, that we were separated from God, that we were unclean, unable to be reconciled to God, unable to take care of the sin in our lives, distanced from a holy God. But we see that God had mercy on us. He didn't leave us in that place. Much like Christ had mercy for Peter, he had mercy on us, not leaving us in that place, dead in our sin. He made us alive again, born again. He made us new, new birth. Then this is not a, a physical rebirth, but this is a spiritual rebirth. This is why Christians often describe themselves as born again. It's a funny phrase, and it's a unique phrase, but it's just a perfect way to describe what's happened to us through Jesus Christ. Once dead in our sins and now alive, made new, born again because of Christ and what he has done. And, And Peter starts off this praising the Lord, praising God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, because he has given us this new birth. Through Christ, through faith in Christ, through belief in his death, as the ransom paid for our sins, and his resurrection, which gives us new life, makes us born again, we are spiritually alive. Let me say that again. This rebirth, this being born again, is possible because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Jesus' death on the cross, which we remembered on Good Friday, pays the penalty for our sin. But it is his resurrection. His resur- in his resurrection, our faith in that resurrection is what makes us alive. We are raised from death to life through the blood of Christ and his resurrection. He has conquered sin and death. Church, this is good news. This is amazing news. Listen to how Paul describes this born again or this this rebirth process. He he explains it in Romans chapter 6. He says, we We were therefore buried with him through baptism in death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. We count ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If we look back at 1 Peter We see that the resurrection of Jesus and our faith in him as our risen Lord and Savior gives us this new life, this born again life, this spiritual rebirth. But there's also much more that we receive. That rebirth, being born again, gives us hope. Gives us hope. This is why Christians are often known as the the people of hope. Where does our hope come from? Our hope comes from the resurrection of Jesus. He was dead and was raised. Death does not have the last word. Sin does not have the last word. Suffering and persecution don't have the last words. Jesus does. He was raised from the dead, and we have this incredible hope because of what he has done. This is why we celebrate Easter. This is why we clapped this morning. It's because he is alive and he gives us this hope. 
that the world can't even comprehend. It's this supernatural hope that we have because Jesus has raised from the dead. He is not found in a tomb somewhere. He is living. He has risen. He gives us hope for today and hope for tomorrow. Now, Peter describes this hope in a unique way. Peter describes this hope as living hope. For everyone that is following Christ, they are born again into this living hope. So the opposite of living hope is dead hope, right? Dead hope would fade away because it has no roots. But a believer has living hope. A living hope grows and it gets better and it gets brighter because it is rooted in the living Christ. Living hope. Living hope is this wonderful gift from God. It's this source that gives us strength and courage in the face of life's harshest trials. I was thinking about what does this living hope mean for us? What does this living hope really bring to us? This rooted hope inside of us that is growing inside of us because we have faith in Christ. What does this hope do for us? Let me read a few things, and you can ponder these this morning. When we are trapped in a tunnel of misery, hope points to the light at the end. When we are overworked and exhausted, hope gives us fresh energy. When we are discouraged, hope lifts our spirits. When we are tempted to quit, hope keeps us going. When we lose our way and confusion blurs the destination, hope dulls the edge of panic. When we struggle with a crippling disease or a lingering illness, hope helps us persevere beyond the pain. When we fear the worst, Hope brings reminders that God is still in control. When we must endure the consequences of bad decisions, hope fuels our recovery. When we find ourselves unemployed, hope tells us we still have a future. When we are forced to sit back and wait, hope gives us the patience to trust. When we feel rejected and abandoned, hope reminds us that we're not alone. Hope reminds us that we'll make it. When we say our final farewell to someone we love, hope in the life beyond gets us through our grief. Put simply, When life hurts, when dreams fade, there is nothing like hope, especially the living hope that fills us through Jesus. So the question before us this morning is, how do we access this hope? How are we born again into this living hope? Well, thankfully, the answer is really quite simple. Scripture tells us that we confess and we believe. Many of you in this room have have done this. You've, You've confessed and you believe in Christ. But maybe there's some of us this morning that have never, ever done that. And you would love hope this morning. A hope that's bigger and greater and more supernatural than just simply thinking about something you're excited about, but a true and meaningful, lasting hope that wells up inside of you. Well, let me offer a a simple way 
that you can come to know Christ and have faith in him through confession and belief this morning. I'm going to put a a prayer up on the screen. And I don't usually do this, but this week as I was preparing, I, I really felt like I wanted to share this with you this morning. Maybe you're in that place and you've come here this morning looking for hope and wondering about Christ. Well, let me offer this prayer. Maybe you feel inside of yourself this morning I want to know Jesus. The prayer is pretty simple. It goes like this. Jesus, I am a sinner and I can't save myself. I need you, Jesus, to save me and make me born again. Jesus, you are the one who has paid the price for my sin and I believe in you. Jesus, you are the one who was raised from the dead, giving me living hope, and I believe in you. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sin and for conquering death on my behalf. I believe, and today I say yes to you. Let me pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, I I thank you for Easter where we can remember, celebrate you and the the resurrection. Jesus, thank you for dying on our behalf, taking on the punishment of our sin, the punishment we deserve. And Jesus, thank you for not staying there in the tomb, but, but being raised again, Lord, conquering death, giving us this living hope. Lord, I pray today that for those that didn't know you, that came to know you today, Lord, I pray that you will give them encouragement and strength and hope in the days ahead. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to take communion uh, together. We take communion here every single Sunday. There's no Uh, perhaps greater Sunday to take communion together than on Easter. Because in the, the taking of the bread together and the drinking of the cup together, we remember the hope that comes through Jesus. These are just symbolic things, but their intent is to remind us of who Christ is and what he has done. This morning, I'm going to just give us a moment to, to pause in the midst of all that's happening this week and all that's gone on even today. And I want us just to close our eyes and quiet our hearts and quiet our minds and just reflect. Reflect on the hope that you have because of Christ. Reflect on what he has done for you. Maybe in your mind you thank him for what he has done. So let's take a moment of quiet together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time where we can quiet our hearts before you, reflect on your goodness to us through your death and through your resurrection. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, right before he went to the cross, 
he sat with his disciples and he had dinner together. And in that moment, he, he took the bread and he said, this bread represents my body, which is going to be broken for you. And we remember that body broken for us. Let's take and eat together. After they had eaten the bread together, he took the cup and he said, this cup and this wine, this juice, this, is, this represents my blood, which is going to be shed for you and has been shed for us to cleanse us from our sin. He said, every time you drink of this cup, remember what I have done for you. So let's take the cup and remember together. Let me pray, and then we're going to close in song. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that on an Easter Sunday morning, we can take communion together, remembering together the incredible hope that we have in this life because of Christ, because of his death and his resurrection. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, the risen Lord and Savior that we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing together. Declare the 
the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Then of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave. Shut 
Great singing, church. Hey, we do this every week. We'd love to have you come back. 1030 on Sundays. We're here to lift up Jesus. We want to learn about Jesus. We want to worship Jesus. We want to praise Jesus. This is a church that's about helping people follow Jesus. So come back and join us next week. We'd love to have you here. Our benediction comes from the book of Hebrews. It says this, And now may the God of peace, who brought back again the dead, our Lord Jesus, equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ all that is pleasing to him. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Go in peace. He is a